So when one thinks about the eye, there's big debate about whether the eye, and well-known debate about whether the eye was designed or is it just so? How could this incredibly complicated thing uh, come into being? And it seems to serve this incredibly complicated purpose. Um, and it is often used uh, in debates about evolution precisely because of its complexity uh, and precisely because it seems to serve such a specialized and critical function. And for me, social networks are like the eye. They are this thing of incredible complexity and beauty. And when you see them, when you see these pictures of social networks, it begs a set of questions as to why do they exist? Why do they come to pass? Do we need a kind of just so story to explain them? Uh, do they just happen to be there for no particular reason? Or do they serve some purpose, some ontological purpose, uh, and some pragmatic purpose? Um, and so, as, so I've been wrestling with this, along with my collaborator, James Fowler, uh, wrestling with where do social networks come from? Um, what purpose do they serve? Uh, what rules do they follow? What do they mean for our lives? And the, and the amazing thing to me about social networks, unlike other equally, no, not equally, other networks that are almost as interesting, networks of neurons, or networks of genes, or networks of stars, or networks of all kinds of other things one can imagine, the amazing thing about social networks is that the, the nodes in the network, the, the entities, the, the components of the network, are themselves thinking, sentient, acting, individuals, uh, individuals that can respond to the network and that can actually form it and make it themselves. So there's this kind of interdigitation between the higher order structure and the lower order structure. Uh, it's, 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 um, it's to me nothing short of remarkable. So this has been the thing that has been animating uh, my research for the last, well, it depends on how you define it, but certainly the last five and perhaps the last ten years. And so I think if I if I might be allowed, I'll, I'll go back and talk a little bit about how I came to be interested in this and, and, and why I think it's so important. Mm -hmm. Because I started my interest in this by studying very simple dyadic networks. Uh, a, a group of people or two people, a pair of individuals, is after all the simplest type of network one can imagine. And, and I began this inquiry or curiosity about networks and network effects in my capacity as a doctor who takes care of people who are terminally ill. So I'm a hospice doctor by training, uh, in addition to my training in social science. And when I was at the University of Chicago, um, I had a very special clinical practice which involved going to people's homes and taking care of people who were dying in their own homes. And I went with my little black bag and to the south side of Chicago on Saturday afternoons, and I would visit people who were dying. And invariably, of course, when I knocked on the door and opened the screen door, and, and these houses, I had a very sort of schizophrenic practice that about a third of my practice was very educated people who were associated with the University of Chicago, and two-thirds were, uh, were indigent people from the south side of Chicago. So this, so this image I have very distinctly in my mind is one of sort of driving to a sort of borderline safe community in the south side of Chicago, uh, parking my car, looking around, walking up the short steps to the door, opening the screen door, knocking on the door, waiting, it seemed often like a long time for someone to come, and being led into people's homes, um, often by the spouse of the person who was dying, offered than be other relatives around. And of course, my primary focus as a hospice doctor was not just on the person who was dying, but also on their family members. And I became increasingly interested in or took seriously the claim that my patient or, or the object of my concern was not just the person who was dying, but also the, the whole family and the other people around the person. A very simple, basic idea. Um, but I began to see that the, 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 in very real way, the illness in the person who was dying was affecting the health status of other individuals in the family. Um, and I began to see this as a kind of non-biological transmission of disease as if illness or death or health care use in one person could cause illness or death or health care use in other people to whom that person was connected. So it wasn't a kind of an epidemic transmission of a germ, but it was something else that was happening. And this is a very basic observation uh, about these interpersonal health effects. 
But as I began to take care of, had more and more clinical experiences caring for such patients, I began to broaden the focus. So I became interested not just in dyadic transmission of illness and illness burden, uh, but also sort of hyperdyadic. So for example, one day uh, I had a, a, a woman who was, who was dying, and her daughter was caring for this person, pretty typical scenario. And of course, the, this, the, woman, the, the person who was dying, an elderly woman, had dementia. She'd been sick for quite a while. The daughter had been exhausted from years of caring mm -hmm. for this elderly person. And in the course of caring, she was so exhausted that her husband uh, also sort of became sick, as it were, from his wife's preoccupation with his wife's mother. And one day I get a call from the husband's best friend, inquiring, because with permission of the husband, asking me about the husband. So here we have parent to child, to the daughter, daughter to her husband, husband to friend. We've got four people, this kind of cascade of effect through the network, as it were. And so, so I began to sort of be obsessed with this notion that these little dyads of people could agglomerate to form uh, larger structures. Again, a very basic idea. And social networks, the way I would describe them, and the way most people nowadays have these very distinct visual images of networks, because literally in the last 10 years, these have become almost a part of pop culture. Uh, those began to be studied in this kind of way, basically beginning in the 50s, actually there was some previous work in the 1930s, beginning in the 50s, but sort of culminating in the 1970s with seminal work that was done by a bunch of sociologists at the time. Um, but those were still very small scale networks, networks of three people or 30 people or that kind mm -hmm. of ballpark. But of course, we're connected through each other into vastly larger, more complex, more beautiful uh, networks of people, uh, networks of thousands of individuals, in fact. And, and these networks are, in a way, especially in the case of human beings or social networks, living, breathing entities, uh, which, which we produce, uh, which have a memory, uh, which have things that flow through them, um, which, which have a purpose, uh, that it can, they can achieve things that are different than can be achieved by the constituent individuals, um, and which are, in fact, very difficult to understand. Um, and so this is how I began to think about social networks about five years ago. And at the time, uh, when I was thinking about this, uh, I was, had moved from the University of Chicago to Harvard, I uh, was introduced to another uh, social scientist, James Fowler, my colleague, who uh, was also beginning to think about different kinds of network problems from the perspective of political science. So he was interested in problems of collective action. How are groups of people organized? Uh, how is it that the action of one individual can influence the action of other individuals? Um, he was also interested in basic problems like altruism. Why on earth would I be altruistic to somebody else? Um, what purpose does altruism serve? In fact, I think that altruism is a, is a key predicate for the um, formation of social networks because it serves to stabilize social ties. If I was constantly violent towards other people or never reciprocated anything they did that was good for me, the network would disintegrate, right? All the ties would be cut. So some level of altruism, in fact, some level of goodness uh, is required for networks to emerge. Um, so now we can begin to think about combining a broad variety of ideas, some stretching back to Plato, thinking about well-ordered societies, thinking about the origins of good and evil, thinking about how it is that people uh, form collectives, uh, thinking about how a state might be organized. In fact, we can begin to visit some ideas engaged uh, by Rousseau and Hobbes and other philosophers on this man in a state of nature, uh, how is it that we undo anarchy? Anarchy can be conceived of as a kind of social network phenomenon, and society and social order can be also conceived of as a social network phenomenon. So just starting from the tiny case of a, 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 a man and a woman, a pair of individuals, one of whom is sick, uh, and the other of whom is caring for the person, and realizing that something is flowing across that tie, stepping back to see them not as individuals, but focusing on the tie that connects them as the object of inquiry. And then seeing, of course, that we're embedded in larger sets of such networks takes you and forces you to engage a set of fundamental social science and philosophical problems, in fact, moral problems, that people have been concerned about for millennia. Uh, one of the things I think that's very interesting or very relevant to, um, to the study of social networks and is, is sort of a key part of the intellectual history of social networks is the following. Um, so in the 50s and in the 